Good evening. I hope everyone is well on their way um, to having a beautiful year and that all of the tefillas and all of the simcha should come to fruition and bring about gladness of heart and happiness which Torah and mitzvahs bring the real happiness. Mekubalim bring that the Torah was supposed to have been given to Noyach. But because the generation was what it was, so he was not Zoycha to be what Moshe Rabbeinu did and bring the Torah. And the 40 days that the Torah was given remained the 40 days by Noyach. But since we have a rule, Ein Mayim Ela Torah, it rained for 40 days. And that he did not bring the Torah to the people. And we know, for instance, that the Zohar HaKadosh says that in the Pasuk of this week's center, Bishnas Sheish Meo Shana Lachaye Noyach, that in the 600th year, he lived 950 years. And in, when he turned 600, that's when the Mabel began. Now, if you look at Le'el of Hashishi, as the Zayar Kodr says, that the 600th year in the 6,000th round of years, which means 5,600, we are today 5,783. But in 5,600, which was like 183 years ago, when the Pusik says, Nivke'u ko mayanos tahom rabba, va'arubos ha'shamayim niftachu, the Zohar HaKadosh says, that when the well, <coughs> <coughs> the well springs under the earth, burst forth, nifku komayinos to home rabba, that it burst forth and gushed water out over the entire world. So the Zohar says that that's what happened in the 600th year of Noyach's life, when he was 600 years old. But when the world will be in the Elif Hashishi, in the 6,000th year of the world's creation, to the 600th year in that thousand years, that is going to be Nivke'u Kol Mayanos HaChochma. That the Zohar Kodesh says that in the year 5,600, 183 years ago, there is going to be an abundance of technology and chokhmah in the world. Now, if you go back 183 years, you will see that in the world, the telephones, the electricity, all that we have that modernized the world happened in these 183 years. Before that, they had tremendous chachamim, you see the buildings and the pyramids and everything they were able to build, but the gushing forth of the Mayanos HaChachma, as the Zayar Kodesh says, will begin in that year and that there's, and you look at the word in the last 180 years, the world's a changed world. We have fax machines, we have airplanes, we have locomotives, and this all in these 183 years. I don't know if it was a safer world or a more sound world before everything happened. 
But anyway, the level of technology and things that were created that we use in our daily lives is incomparable. There's no comparison to what they had 300 years ago and to what they have today. And the main thing is that we should use it l'shem shamayim. And there's so much accessible, for instance, for Torah learning, that someone wants to know about a topic. I don't operate a computer, but for those who do, they're able to see with the push of a button, a topic, with all the Roshonim and all the Achroinim and so much that they never had at their fingertips. When the Snei Chemed made his nine volumes, Snei Chemed, it's like an encyclopedia of a genius that he cites everything like you're pushing a button on a computer and it's listening to your, that's how he did it without the computer. So there were gifts that were given to the world in Ruchnius, which made a difference, a very big difference in terms of the functioning of the world. Now, we know that Noyach means, the name Noyach means to rest, Menucha, Noyach, or it means to make easier. And indeed, there were many, <coughs> excuse me, many things <coughs> that Noyach did that improved the quality of life in the world. Uh, until Noyach came, because of the curse that Adam Arisha was given, that when people wanted to plant, what grew out was thorns. From Noyach's birth on, People planted, and out of the ground came some very, uh, if they planted wheat, wheat grew out, not thorns, like before Noyach. The Medrash says this. They planted barley, there was barley that came out. So there was a major difference in the quality of life that the people had to, he invented the plow, told them people with their fingers had to plow the ground to get anything out. They had to put their fingers into the ground and that from that they were able to turn the soil over. But once he came, he made life easier. There was a plow that did that instead of putting their fingers, as the Medrash says, into the ground. But the question that they raised the Mephorshim is Noyach, when he was born, they gave him the name Noyach. How did the people know that he in his lifetime was going to make life easier and invent the plow? They didn't know that at the time he was born, and they gave him the name when he was born. So how did they call him Noyach without having had the experiences of technology and things that he did to make their life easier? And the answer the Medrash says is that the world knew. They were wondering from Adam, when are things going to start getting easier? I mean, the curse came to give birth was a very big task and, a, and painful task that to have Parnassa, they have to go through also pain and suffering to get some food. And they wanted a change of events. And how did they know that the change, when the change of events would be? So they knew, says the Medrash, that when someone will be born, nolad mohol, that he will be born circumcised, as if he had a physical bris. 
that's when things will start to get easier. And when he was born, Noyach, he was the first one, Noilad Moho. He was born a newborn baby with nothing done, and he was Moho, and he was circumcised. So they knew that he was going to be the one to answer their cries and their prayer, their tefillah, that things should get easier for them. And it would be that baby who would bring it about, and that's why even before everything happened, they named him Noyach, that there would be the easier, less painful requirement. from him to be able to survive in this world. Now, there was one chet, there was one thing that Noyach is criticized for more than anything else. And there was some criticism later on was that he was not misfollow for his door. He didn't, people came up to him and asked him, what are you building over here, the, the ark? To build the teva, the ark, it took 120 years. So along these 120 years, people would say, what are you doing over here? And he would answer that Hashem's gonna bring a marble, the world is not behaving properly, and there's gonna be a lot of destruction. And they ignored him. Now, because he didn't turn around and daven at any point, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that the people should do tshuva, people should get better. So he had to come back, say the Mekubalim, and he came back to this world as the Shema was Moshe Rabbeinu. And that's why Noach was saved in an ark, in a teva, and at the beginning of Moshe Rabbeinu's life, he had to be put into a little teva in the water, and that's how he was saved. He was saved at that point from being killed by Paro and being thrown into the cement or into the water by the soldiers around. And he the one who saved him was Basia Basparo. And her name, Basia, if you transpose, you change around the order of the letters. Basia spells Teva. Because not only was he saved in a Teva, but the one who saved him also was a reference to the Teva. And it says that there was no one in all of Sefer Barashas who davened for Klal Yisrael more. I mean, he's in Shemos, but there was no one in that whole Tekufa who davened more for Klal Yisrael. And that was a ticket for what he did wrong in his previous life that he didn't secure a change of events by his davening for them. And he had to come back and constantly daven for Klai Yisrael. They did this in the Midbar. Hashem wanted to destroy Klai Yisrael. And he davened that the Hashem should not destroy Klai Yisrael. So he came back to be Mesach in the Pagan to fix up the mistake he made much earlier and to daven on behalf of the people. And we see constantly, it wasn't once, until the ultimate tefillah that Moshe Rabbeinu daven when they made the Egel Hazav, the golden calf, and Hashem said, I had it with them, I want to just wipe them out and I'll start fresh with you. And Moshe Rabbeinu davened very, very intentively 
that they should not be destroyed. And he even went so far to make a statement, and if you don't forgive them, erase me from your book, from your Torah. Now we know that Moshe Rabbeinu's name is mentioned in every sedra from the first sedra of Shemos all the way through to the end of Dvarim to Zos HaBrocha. And in every sedra his name is mentioned. But there's one sedra, Titzava, that Moshe Rabbeinu's name is not mentioned at all. And that is Parsha's Tetzave. And that is the reason, because it says that Moshe Rabbeinu was the cementing factor for Klai Yisrael to remember the Torah, because he taught them the Torah, and he went over the Torah with them many times. And when he was Nifter, the Gemara says that 3,000 halachas were forgotten on the day that Moshe Rabbeinu was nifter, because he was the cementing factor. And you pull out the cement from in between the bricks, the bricks collapse. And he was like the backbone to remember well every aspect of Torah. Now, when he was nifter, it disappeared. And the Gemara says 3,000 halachas were forgotten. Now, if he's the backbone for remembering the Torah, and in Parshish Tetzave, his name is not mentioned at all, so how do we remember Parshish Tetzave? So the answer, say the Mekubalim, that the Parsha has 101 psukim, and Moshe Rabbeinu, who's not mentioned, so how are we going to remember Tetzave? So HaKadosh Baruch Hu brought down the Malach Michoel, who is the one in Shemayim, the representative to help Klai Yisrael remember the Torah. And since Moshe Rabbeinu was not here in Parshish Tetzava, the Malach himself came down. How do we know it? Because at the end of every sedra, it tells us how many psukim are in that sedra. And at the end of Tetzave, it says Kuf Aleph, 101, meaning 101 Psukim. And then it gives a simon that is the gematria of that number. And the simon for Parshas Tetzave is the name Michoel. The actual Malach, since Moshe Rabbeinu was not here, the Malach came to make sure that the remembrance of the Torah should continue on. And for that day or two, that's why they forgot 3,000 halachas, till he came into place and became the simon and the gematria of the center. And with that, Moshe Rabbeinu had no longer the need at any point to daven to save Klai Yisrael. He did it many times. And this was so forceful that he didn't have to do it again. And he didn't have to he didn't have to extend himself with such severity to save Claudius Yisrael. I just made before the taping a bracha so I Now, before the Mabel, it says that Noyach, the words in the Torah is Mipne Mea Mabel, that the water started coming down and the animals all went into the ark and the people, and, and Noyach was hesitant. And Rashi says, what was that he was like pushed in by the water? And Rashi says, Hoyamamin, he believed that there would be a, a flood. 
but there was a percent of him that didn't believe and he was hesitant to go in. He didn't know what was really going to happen. So the Zlotch of a Magid, Zecher Tzadik V'Kadosh Levracha Zechus O'Yogein Oleinu, says, how could that be? I mean, if the Torah was made, it's not like a person, sometimes you hear by Hespedim, people get up and they say things you don't even know who they're talking about because the exaggeration and the it, it's so tremendous you're wondering is was did he mean to come to a different Leviah? that is that the nifter that's not what how the nifter lived or whatever so we sometimes say things which are not a hundred percent accurate So ask the Zlotch of a Magid, this is the Torah that said, Ish, Noya Hoya Ish, Tzadik, Tomem Hoya Vidoroso, that the Torah is made, he was a Tzadik, a Tomem. That's not somebody giving a husband that they could be nonsense. The Torah is made. When it says Tzadik, it means Tzadik. When it says Tomem, it means Tzadik. So what do you mean? If it called the Torah called him tzaddik, how in the world could he have been a mammon and ain't no mammon? That the water had to push him in? Look in Rashi, Mipne Mehamabul, you'll see that Rashi says that. So the Zlotch of Magid said it doesn't mean he did not have that he had the moon and he didn't. He believed, but he really didn't believe so much. It means that when a person has full emuna, he is able to see things through like he wanted and like he thought. That means the power of emuna, that even if something of Shemaim's looking, should we do this for the person or not? There's many of mitzvahs, but there's many of veiris, and there's mesupik, what to do? But if the person, his machshava, has such faith that the Rabbana Shalom will do that, and then it has to happen. Noyach didn't want the Mabel to wipe out the world. And he felt <coughs> that if he has thousand percent emuna, that there's going to be the Mabel, then it's going to have to be. So he left two percent open of not believing, maybe it's not going to happen, maybe the people are starting to do tshuva, maybe this, maybe that. So it won't have to happen, and that's why he was an eno mamen, to leave open the possibility of it not happening to the world, such devastation and such tremendous destruction. So says the Zlotch of Amagin. And many Hasidic groups say it in a different way. Some say Machshava Moelas, some say Tracht Gut and this Vedzain Gut. Think positive and it will end up positive. And according to how strongly the person feels something good is going to happen, makes it happen. And that's the power of positive thinking and the level of positive thinking. How much do you really believe it's going to be is the scale of how it's going to turn out. The machshava can go with that process that things can happen, beautiful things, positive things, because the person really believed that it would end up happening, and it's not so easy, because we always have those doubts, and we always have those questions that come into mind. But if we are able to push ourselves and have the amuna, the bitachon, that is so important, the back bone of goodness is helping in the process by believing 
that things could be better and will be better to actually help along in making it happen. Now, it says that after Noyach came out, in the beginning of the Sedra, the Medrash says this, that it says that Noyach was ish, Tomem Tzadik, Hoyam Bedorosov, he was tremendous. And when he came out of the Teva, it says, Vayochel Noyach, and the Medrash said, what does it mean, Vayochel? He became chulen, he became mundane, weekday. Because here you saw the whole world being destroyed in front of your eyes. Is the first thing after that, that you come back into the world, you plant a vineyard and you want delicious, good wine? Is that what you learned from this experience? You know, somebody's in a car and and he has a terrible accident and he walks out that the car is totaled, but he doesn't have a scratch on him. He walks away from the car. Under many normal circumstances, the car was destroyed and something would have happened to the person, if not death, but at least end up in the hospital. Now that person walking out after realizing what just happened, could he just go five minutes later and say, you know, I wanted to enjoy myself and go swimming. I mean, wouldn't he go right away to Bench Goimel? Wouldn't he want to make a Suda Soda? Wouldn't he take out a, a, a Tillam and say, Ten Kapitlach of Tillam, Prokham of Tillam to thank the Rabbana Shalom for what he just went through? So that's one person with one car. Here the whole world in front of his eyes was destroyed. And that's why the Medrash says, Vayochel Noyach, he became Chulim, because the Medrash says in the beginning of the Sedra, it says Ish Tzadik, that he was a Tzadik. But at the end of the, when he comes out of the Teva, it says, Ish Ho'adama, he became an earthly person dealing only with the mundane, and the, the daily experience of what it means to live in life. And um, and that's why it calls him, and it makes a comparison to Medrash, that Moshe Rabbeinu in the beginning, the first time he's mentioned of the daughters of Yisro called them Ish Mitzri. When the father Yisro asked them, what are you home so quick today, so early? So they answered that there was an Egyptian man and who saved us. We were already in the well. They were drowning us, the shepherds. They wanted us dead. They weren't just chepping with them. They wanted, they were in the wall, and he pulled them out of the well and saved their lives. But they referred to him as an Ish Mitzri, an Egyptian man. And the Medrash says that after Moshe Rabbeinu was told that he cannot go into Eretz Yisrael, he davened and at least let me be buried. Okay, I'll be nifter out of Israel, out of Eretz Yisrael. But when I have to be buried, let me be buried in Eretz Yisrael. And the answer he got was, because those girls thought you were Egyptian, that you were such a kadosh, and you should have looked not like an Egyptian. There was a criticism to him, but they thought you were, how you were dressed and everything, even though he was a fugitive of law, he was running away from Paro, but he still should have looked like a Yid, not like an Egyptian. And the Medrash says, and that's why he was turned down. Then he could not be buried uh, in Eretz Yisrael. We know, of course, that 
Many people says the Ariza will not be zoyfer to trias amesim. But if they are buried in a cemetery where there's a big tzaddik, that they could latch onto the tzaddik when he goes to Eretz Yisrael by trias amesim, and the whole cemetery can go with the tzaddik. So, <clears throat> Moshe Rabbeinu anyway had to remain out because of all the 600,000 that died in the Midbar and the 36,000 of Shevet Ephraim who left Mitzrayim early were there in, in the Midbar, in the desert. Though when the, there was Trias Mason, he's going to take all those people out to Eretz Yisrael, so he had to be buried out of Eretz Yisrael. And that's the reason that many tzaddikim mm-hmm. said that they did not want to be buried in Eretz Yisrael, that wherever they're nifter, that they should remain where they are. Even one of the stone, the Rebbes, who was nifter around 80 years ago, carried his tachrichim with him, the shrouds with him, wherever he went, and he was nifter in Detroit, and to this day, the Stoliner Hasidim go on his yard site two weeks after Pesach to Detroit, to his kever. I remember as a little boy when 20, 25 people would come from New York, Stoliner Hasidim. Today, they got 3,000 coming years later as it built up the Hasidus. But the reason he and all the others wanted to remain wherever they were nifter to be buried and not to have Cheshboin as well, take him to Israel, take him back to New York, was to be able to help the people of that cemetery who were on the edge of coming back to Trias and Mesim and Eretzel or not, and that they could make the difference for them in going back to Eretzel. So... He was called Ish Mitzri in the beginning, and then later in Zos Habrachi, he's referred to as Ish Ho'elokim, says the manager. So he started off Ish Mitzri and became higher Ish Ho'elokim, godly. But by Noyach, says the manager, he started off Ish Tzadik and went down to Ish Ho'adama because he did not take heed and internalize what he should have internalized from what happened to the world. Now, the After the Mabel, <clears throat> Noyuch wanted to send out the first, was a raven. And he came back, he never really went anywhere, he was just circling the... So, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Noyuch sent out the Yona, the dove. And... And he came back with the Ali Zayas Torah Bafia. And there are some who say that when Yaakov Avinu went back for the Pachim Ketanim, the reason he went back was because in one of those jugs was the oil that they were going to find. And that's why he signed it as Kohen Gadol, because Avram Yitzhak and Yaakov all had a halach of a Kohen Gadol. That's how they were able to go in Harabayas and sleep there. And that everything that, that uh, they did. So Noyach, um, uh, Noyach sent out the raven first. And the Medrash talks much about it. The raven asked him, why in the world are you sending me out? It could, it could be that I won't be able to even come back. I'll get, I'll drown, I'll, I'm going out on a mission. I don't know what's going to happen to me. So the Medrash says that a Baruch Hu answered Noyach. 
and said to Noyach that no, that Noyach answered a Kodesh Baruch Hu and said to him, the reason I'm sending out this raven is because the meat of the raven, which is treif, but even Goyim won't eat it because it's rough, tough meat that it's not edible. Even with cooking and everything, it's difficult to eat. So what does the world need? It's not, you can't use a raven for korbanos, Noyak said, the Medrash says, that will have a mezbeach, will have a pesam migdid, will have this, that, that you can't give korbanos from the, with the raven because it's a treif animal. And for eating, people won't eat it. So what does the world need the raven? So if it doesn't come back, who needs it? So, and we know that Hashem wanted every species to exist. So if the raven would have been lost, how would there be ravens in the world? There was only his wife, because he would have been destroyed. So the Medrash says that the raven's wife was pregnant with a boy. And that's how there was going to be a continuation of it. And some say that Noyach sent the raven because he was very upset with the raven. Because the rule was that during a mabel, when the world is shruya bitsar, that there's so much pain and destruction, everyone's dying, everything's being destroyed, you're not allowed to have relations. And the only one who defied the request that was being asked of the people was the raven who lived, had relations with its mate, and she became pregnant during that time. So he was angry with the raven and wanted, to, he didn't bother him if the raven never came back because he was very angry with the thing. Now, we know that everyone was destroyed in the marble except for the fish because there is no ayin hara and curse that could be effective in anything in the water. That's why many tzaddikim who went to the mikvah, they used to say in the mikvah, just even when they just came out, but they were still full in the water with their bakoshes for this name to be, have a refu shlema, here being undressed and, and in the state of how they are, but they didn't, you know, they, they put their arms up and they, whatever they did, because in water there's bracha, and that is the reason why there's three things in this seder that it says Hashem gave it a bracha. One was people. Adam got a bracha. Shabbos got a bracha. Shabbos got a bracha. And the fish got a bracha. And that's why men... On Shabbos, eat fish. Then you'll ask, why is it that the whole Klal Yisrael begins pseudos, even Shalashudas, that you don't have, you have the pseudo, but you wash. Why don't they have kugel at every Shalashudas? Why don't they have fish? Herring and whatever. Because it was the fish, because the herring is in, from the water also. It's a fish. And those had the bracha. And we want all three sudas that man eating fish on Shabbos, all three being the, all three being created attached to bracha. And that's why none of the fish. Uh, Died in the Mabra. Now, coming back to the raven, when Noyach said this to the raven, who wants you? Your, your meat is tough and, you're, and it's not edible, no korbanos. So, Akkadish Baruch Hu answered him and said, Everything in creation has its use. And the ravens will be needed at one point also. 
Now we know in the times of Elio Hanavi, he was in the time of Achav. Achav was the king and he was a big Russia. He was a very big Russia. And he was an Oivet of Odezara, and he did everything possible to get as many people to be also Oivde of Odezara. So Elio said, Look how the people are behaving. Destroy them, make a drought that there'll be no water. And Hashem made the drought. And Achav knew that he was davening for this, so he wanted to kill him. So Elio ran to Hara Carmel and hid there, and he had no food. And it was, the Gemara says, that the ravens went and raided the food storage house of Achav and took all the meat up they were each raven was flying meat and bread to the the top of Hara Carmel where Elio was so he had food and you see that the ravens were useful and one of the reasons it was ravens who brought the food was because Noyuk said you have no use in this world because Elio was saying that the, the, you, there's no use for them. If they're Avodah what's their use? What's the value of any good thing that they're doing if they're Oivdi Avodah So Hashem said, look at the ravens. That's what Noyuk said, that they were worthless. Yet you're living and alive because of those ravens. They're bringing you the food. And just like the door is, they are oiv de avodazara, but they have their purpose here in the world. And the Lushan that Elio said, he feiru es berisi. So many Mephorshim write and say that it means that he was saying that they're not doing your Torah, they're not learning your Torah, they're not using your Torah, they're not living with your Torah. But others say that he basically said, hey, Feiru as Barisi, that the Kedusha by Klal Yisrael of the Briskoidish was being misappropriated, misused. It was being abused. And the Kedusha was fleeting away. They were doing a virus with their bris. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu said that I see that you don't really value the Yidden just because they're doing this Avera. Now, we know that the Avera is very bad. Because we have a rule that if a Yid decides to do an Avera, but at the end he doesn't do the Avera, he's not punished for his thoughts of wanting to do the Avera. It's only if he actually does the Avera. By Goyim, the Machshava is, Kamai said, they're planning to kill someone, but something came up, they couldn't kill the person. They are judged in heaven as if they did kill that person. But there's one exception to that rule, that if a Yid plans to be an Oyved Avodah and he gets into his car to travel to a church, and to be baptized, lo aleinu, lo aleichem, chas v'sholem. And he wants to become a Catholic, an oivet avodah Muslims is not avodah because they held that the prophet Mohammed was a prophet, not God. But by the, by the Catholics, it's real avodah And... If someone's traveling to become a goy and he gets a flat tire 
So he never makes it to the church. That is one case that he is considered an oived avodah even just with the machshava, even if he did not end up doing it. So Hashem said to Elio, you know, your attitude to Yidin is not good. Because they're oivdi avodazor, you want to completely write them off? I want you to go to every bris, every bris that every year, we have Elio Navi at every bris. Elio Navi comes to every bris. So the Medri says that Elio Navi answered a Kurdish Baruch and said, what? You want me to go into, there's 50 people at the bris, they're all busy doing a virus. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, you know what? I want you at every bris. And when you come, there's going to be mechilas avoidance for every person attending that bris. So when you come in and have to look at their faces, you're not going to see any Avera. You're going to see just the Kedusha of a Yiddish Neshama. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, to Elio Hanavi, and that, and the Bnei Sustra brings it, it was left like that, that every time we have a bris, Elio shows up, and indeed, there is mechilas and kaparas avoinas for every yid who is attending that bris. And the Balaturim brings that it says that when the raven went out, he couldn't find Yevoshes any dry area. He couldn't find any dry area. And the Balaturim, Balaturim who was the Russia's son, lived 750, 800 years ago says that the word Yevoshes, dry land, is the same letters as Tishbi, which is a reference to Elio Hanavi. Because since so many held that what Elio Hanavi was saying was that they were made for the bris, that Yevoshes, which means dry land, the schus of how Elio will be able to be in a bris is the Yavoshas, Tishbi. Tishbi means Elio Anavi. So says the Baal Haturim. So the, and, and the Shalar Kodosh has a very long discussion about the fact this concept of what the Averis were by Elio, that he said that Kodesh Baruch was such a oiv de avodah zarah, just destroy them all, they're worthless. And Hashem said, the, what you think is worthless, that's how you're living, it's the ravens that Noyach also said were worthless, and you're living because of those ravens. Now, I, I just want to conclude and say that there are a number of reasons listed in the Medrash why the world was destroyed by the Mabo. Many things. I mean, the Pasuk says about Timoleha, or it's Chomos, that the robbery, they were going into their neighbors' houses and robbing them clean. They went to swim in the river, or they went out of the house and their next door neighbor came in and looted the house. This was daily life. And, and there were many other Averis which were being done that different opinions why it came to a mob. So 
one of the Mepharshim say that it was because the delight out of life and the pleasure was all they lived for. It's all they lived for. Now, if you say that they were improper and morally, you know, that's a serious thing. But if somebody came home and wanted to enjoy dinner, I mean, was that so bad that they deserved to be wiped out? So the point that I want to share with you is what the Mepharshim Hamedrish say on this. It wasn't that they wanted to enjoy life. We, of course, have a different attitude. You can come home and enjoy a delicious dinner, and you can wear a nice clean suit and have a nice house to live in and to, to enjoy. But that's not the end. We are there to give a nachas ruach to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So a person has a nice house, he's thinking, well, how can I have achnas asorachim, or how can I do something in the house that this house will be mekad Shem shamayim, and that it will be a nachas ruach to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that Hashem will have pleasure from this house. When a chos and kala get married, are they just worried about the couch? And the color of the carpet that's going to match? Or are they going to say, you know, we have to start off on the right foot. So at least one guest has to be at our table. Because if we don't have at the beginning, then it'll be three times a year, six times a year, but it's not going to be a regular thing, which will provide a nachas ruach for HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And if a person opens the door of a supermarket because an elderly man or lady is going in or coming out, that if he has the machshava, this is going to be a Kiddush Hashem. He sees I'm wearing a yarmulke, he knows I'm Jewish, and he'll think, what a nice Jewish man that he held for us the door, or he did this or he did that. So, it wasn't the pleasure of life, because we're not told, we're not aesthetic, we're not monks on top of a mountain, that they're not allowed to talk, and they're not allowed to be married, and they're not allowed to do this, they're not allowed to do that, a life. Hashem did not ask that of us. We can run a regular life, but what's the purpose in life? What's the goal of our actions? What's the target that we want to reach and we want to realize with our words, with our actions and our behavior? And since they set their whole mindset into action under the umbrella of pure pleasure, it has to be digressed, and it ends up bad, not good. Because one thing goes from the next when you're in the realm of forgetting about HaKadosh Baruch Hu and forgetting about the purpose of our actions and everything that we do. So we hope that we will, at the beginning of the year as it is, reroute our machshava, our dibur, and our maisa to internalize that when we do something to get used to the fact that we want good for HaKadosh Baruch Hu and we want to bring out the best. A person eats a delicious steak, he could think at the same time, this should give me strength and he can enjoy the, ste the steak, but it should give me strength to daven, to learn, to run, to do a mitzvah. I need strength to do it. So at the number one, he's enjoying. But behind that enjoyment is a silver platter of nachas ruach to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Have a wonderful week. Bracha v'hatzlacha.